Uh, kind of reminds me the days back when I was a teen and I'd go to school and, and I didn't go to parties and dances at least in the younger years until I got old enough to be stupid. But I mean, uh, but anyhow, you'd go to school and wow, was that a great party. And eventually I succumbed to the peer pressure and I went. And as I went to these parties, what do I find? Two girl, groups of girls screaming at each other. A couple of people passed out. Guys fighting outside. Someone throwing up in the bushes. And I went, yeah, pretty great. Uh, and then I'd get to school the next week and they'd go, man, that was a great party. And I'd go, really? I mean, I was there. I guess I wasn't at the right one. Uh, well, for you that were here last week, I don't, uh, or for you that were here last week, I don't know if we had a great party or not, but if you missed it, you should have been there. I guess that's what they used to tell me as a teen, anyhow, at school. So what did we talk about? We talked about the power of making a stand and fighting the battle. We used the Ephesians 5 reference where it says, having done all to stand, and we pictured the Old Testament mighty man of David who stood in the middle of the field when everybody had left and he made a stand. It wasn't an invitation to passivity. On the contrary, it's a very offensive posture. We looked at the paradox of our God who has won the victory already won the victory and yet he goes let's suit up and fight how a good God who can do it all by himself and infinitely better than us somehow somehow he takes joy in bringing us along and giving his kids the responsibility of spiritual warfare once again it's a paradox to us a mighty God who has no needs no equals, no limitations, and yet he calls us in his power and authority to fight and move forward the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to think this for a second. Think of the implied value that God has given to us to put us in that position. There's something being said there. How much he values us. God who can do all things without us and better than us has chosen to use us. Little old you and me to bring about this victory that he's already won. We're placed, a, we're called a place on our armor and we're going to get our shield of faith out and our sword, which is the Word of God. You see, we are called to the doing type of faith, not the standing or sitting and learning type of faith. I think so many times, Christians, that's where we get stuck. Or just to learn some more stuff. We're called to the doing type of faith. So if you missed it last week, I taught extensively on the verbal proclamation of God's Word in Jesus' name. The Word of God being our sword, and we are called to use it. Now that implies two things. First of all, we're to know the Word of God. You see, if you just read God's word, some like some Christian obligation, this is what Christians do. I used to feel guilty because I didn't read the Bible enough. And so I would go and I would read a whole big bunch in a row and I felt better about myself because I read the Bible and that's what Christians are supposed to do. But if you read it like that, you will miss the treasure hunt as you read it. If you read it like some historical record, you will miss the relevance for today. There was a chorus we used to sing when I was young. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter we learn, verse, every line. Watermelon, watermelon. I can't remember the rest of it. Anyhow. Every 
great promise that is made to God's people in that mysterious book of life is yours and mine. And our mission is to find every one of them and to know them. Do you know there's promises for health and well-being, for peace and joy and financial favor? There's promises for loved ones and family, special authority for parents and grandparents. There's promises for the land and for its fertility. There are promises for loved ones and family, a special authority for parents. There's promises even for opening up amazing possibilities for opening up the road to receive the people, the lost generation for Christ. Even in the prayer given to us by the Lord himself has within it the promise of bringing heaven to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What do we know about heaven? No more sickness or pain or tears or loss. What it is saying is, is that we have been given the power and authority to bring a little bit of heaven down here on earth. And so many times we don't realize that God has given to us that tremendous potential. You know, there's a scripture we used to quote when I was younger. I think it's Apostle Paul who says, you know, we, we see it like a, a through a darkling shadow. And we see it in part, but in then we'll, we'll see it in full. And we talk about, well, in heaven it'll all be clear. I want to tell you there's a word there that's missed. We see it in part now. <coughs> I just swallowed half of it. <coughs> They get all excited. We see it in part now. There are times that we are given glimpses of what God is doing in the heavenly realms. And if Linda was saying it exactly right. Lord God is speaking it to us all the time. You say, well, I'm not sure about that. Will you start obeying when the Lord gives you little promptings and you will find out that he's talking all the time? Somebody was saying to me this week, they were listening to a guy and they said, you know, the guy get up and goes, boy, I feel like, I sure feel like a, a Timmy's this morning. And he said, you know what? That could be God talking to you. You think you're going for coffee. There's an opportunity. That's why God's placed in your heart to go have a cup of coffee. I don't have a scripture for that. We have the power and authority to bring a little heaven to earth. By the way, when does our eternal life start? How about the moment we asked Jesus into our hearts and we became citizens of heaven? We are in this world, but we're not of it. So by the gift of salvation and the authority of the name Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been given the ability to share a little heaven on earth while we are still in this world. And I want to tell you the Bible's full of promises for us to learn and to discover. The second thing is implied in that idea is once we know it, we're to use it. It's a sword of the Spirit that can change everything. If we use the power of God's word and the authority of Jesus, we can change history. And we need to wake up about that. I don't know what might make any difference. My little prayers. I'll tell you, the enemy isn't feeling that way. When I open my mouth, and I declare the truth that I know is from God, there's no spiritual enemy that can stand against that. That's God's word. To declare God's word and promises out loud in the name of Jesus may sound a little weird. That's okay, we're called to be a little weird. 
Can I say that Christians are the kind of people that talk out loud by themselves? It is a little weird, and we've got to be careful who we're around with, because they will lock us up. But it's supposed to be normal. So does it make a difference? I think I had it in my notes last week, I don't know if I got it out, but there, this is such a powerful tool in a Christian arsenal that the devil will whisper lies at you to keep you quiet. I would imagine every one of us pray at times. How many of us feel uh, confident to pray out loud? That's a smaller group. And in some groups, it's even smaller yet. Why? The enemy does not want you to be using anything close to God's word out loud. I'll just think it. I want to tell you, God hears your thoughts. He sees into our hearts. The enemy needs the word. Anyhow, anytime you think this is dumb or I feel foolish, you're listening to a lie that you don't make a difference. The enemy can seem so big and yet if we are so bold to take our place in authority and power and speak the word in Jesus' name, I will guarantee you the enemy is scattering just like someone dropped a holy bomb. You see, the shield of faith is not only the block from the enemy's lies, his, his darts, it is also our eyes to see what's going on. The enemy goes around like a roaring lion. Who is my God? He is the lion. The enemy's got the church often in a crouch, hoping we won't get attacked again. But I know one thing is, the enemy is scared spitless of a people saved by Jesus that know how to operate in the authority that we've been given in his name. Well, I do have scripture today. I had her, uh, Linda, read 1 John 5, uh, chapter 5 of the first verses, and I want to continue on. So the reason I had her read that so is you have the continuity of it. 1 John 5. So he's been talking so far about the importance of being children of God, about operating as children in obedience and, and the whole package. We're going to talk about this next Sunday. I sometimes have a hard time getting done preparing one sermon because I'm already preparing in my head where God's God is going the next Sunday. Anyhow, the importance of obedience and the importance of living a life clean with God. And he ends up with this, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, verse 13, so that you may know you have eternal life. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases us. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know he will give us what he asks for. This is another place where we get into a little bit of analysis paralysis. Am I to ask him or just do it? How do I know what the will of the God is in this situation? If I'm unsure, maybe I'm better not to try. Do you know that many Christians use thy will be done at the end of their prayer, not as a confidence assurance, but as a way not to expect anything? Oh God, do this in the name of Jesus, thy will be done. It's almost like the end word is an affirmation of a lack of faith. I'm not saying don't use thy will be done, but my goodness, that should be part of the charge. Thy will be done. Instead of, I'm just not so sure about who this God is and I'm not sure if he wants to do something today. So what do we do? 
Well, first we get into scripture, and then we find out that everywhere that Jesus healed everyone that came to him, that he was already always ready to do good. I can't find a place in the teachings of Jesus where people were seeking him that he did not reach out and touch them back. I can't find one place. So if you're struggling whether or not it's God's will, just put that in the brain bank a little there. Remember the story of the woman in the crowd that reached under or over around the crowd and touched the hem of the garment and was healed? I mean, she didn't sit and ponder whether, I don't know whether this is God's will or not. I don't know. I, I'm not even asking permission. Should I do this? No, she reached in there and she shoplifted a healing. She stole one. And Jesus runs around and he goes, who touched me? And the disciples are thinking this is goofy because they're in a crowd and everybody's touching Jesus. And what do you mean, who touched you? And he said, somebody got some power. And so he sees this woman, and does he scold her? No, he goes, your faith has made you well. In other words, you got it, girl. You understand what this is about. You know who I am. I'm good. When you come in contact with a good God, good things happen. So what does the word God's word say here? It's never wrong to ask God what he wants to do. It's never wrong. Maybe there are some specific things. You know, there are some times when I've been praying for people or people have been praying for me and they're praying about something specific and yet God holds up the proceedings to let somebody know that God wants to pray for the whole of me before he touches a specific part of me. There are parts of me, sometimes I, I might be going through things. I, I could be struggling and maybe God's got to reveal something in my life that would resist him. Sometimes there's enemy attack. And God's going to let you know what's going on there. Remember the account of the demoniac that the disciples tried to free? And couldn't, so they came back to ask Jesus, what's going on? Jesus says, oh, this one takes prayer and fasting. See, God is a general. And he sees everything. He knows every play for every battle. He knows it all. And so asking him is never wrong. But yet, we are encouraged in the word of God to use the name of Jesus and declare by the faith that God has given us to do good things. Am I making this at all clear? I've got the deer in the headlight look here this morning. Praise the Lord. Yeah. It's only nine more minutes and we get to be free of this man. There's something you can bank on, and that's one thing, and that God is good, and he loved the whole world so much that he came and died so that all could be saved, not that all will be saved, but that, so that all can have opportunity. And what is it that lead, uh, leads us to repentance? His kindness. So expect good and perfect gifts from Him for yourself and for others. Just expect that God wants to do stuff. Expect results when we reach out in that love to see others touched. If what you do is out of God's love, you can be sure it is His will. Oh, and then there comes a lie. Perhaps we who are praying we're not worthy enough, we didn't have a good enough week, and we're certainly not the people to use that kind of authority in Jesus' name. I want to tell you, who is it that condemns the believers? It's the enemy. That's when you get that shield of faith up there, and I get the sword ready, and here it comes. 
There is therefore no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit in the name of Jesus. I find only one place the disciples asked Jesus to do something and he said, nope. The account found in Luke 9, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and they're stopping through on their way through Samaria. I don't know what the thing is. He sent the disciples ahead. I don't know if to do a meeting or just to prepare a place for Jesus to rest on the journey. I'm not sure. All I can see is the people are a little less than excited about Jesus' travel plans and they don't want him, they don't welcome him. And there's two brothers of the disciples, James and John. We'll find out why they were called the Sons of Thunder. Uh, decide a little power show would do the trick. So they asked Jesus, do you want us to bless this town with a little hellfire and thunder? Because if we wipe them out, that'll teach them. Well, Jesus over overrules that little request. Why? Because his mandate was to save, not to destroy. Likewise, our mandate is not to bring judgment, but to seek God how he might reach them for Christ. I want to say, all that being said, is we all have people that we would like to be blessed with their absence. Do you have any people in your life like that? There are folks, no matter what we do or how hard we try, all they can see is our faults, they can't see our worth. Now you can try to pray against those people, but I'll tell you, I found very little success in doing that. So what do we do? In our quiet place, we pray for them. Not against them, but we pray for them. And declare the enemy's hands to be still in this situation. Try to look beyond the people that choose to hate us and see it's the enemy hating Jesus that is at the heart of it. I want to tell you, I haven't had a lot of success in this area. My family has had to move because there was one emotionally uh, struggling woman that took on a hatred for us and attacked our family for months until we had to move out of our house. There was another time I had to leave a job because of a personal attack at work that was continual for years. I've endured loss because of personal attacks. And you know what? I haven't been very happy about any of them. Spiritual warfare, it's real and it's personal. And we must let God work it out. But that doesn't mean we stand idly by. We use our sword of the Spirit and we keep up the fight. Not with flesh and blood, but with power and authorities in darkness. And we must believe that God is able and more than able to do His work through us. To bring about His plan of redemption. I want to say just a short word about conflicts that happen in church. I've seen churches that once were vibrant and alive, now used as office space or homes, because the believers got so entrenched as to who was right and who was wrong, they forgot the fight wasn't against their brother and sister. It was against spiritual war. Authorities. Attack on the church itself. You don't think for a moment that the enemy isn't planning to kill churches. Even this church. And he'll use dissension, unforgiveness, fear, and the many lies that he would tell us to accomplish it. And if we're not ready to fight him, we could be in trouble. I think one of the greatest weapons he uses us to convince, or uses on us, is to convince us of our powerlessness to stop it. Or to take new ground. You know what? The enemy, the last thing he wants to hear is a church go, What's next, God? 
let's go win this thing. People, all of us, are far from perfect, but people are never our enemy. I want to tell you, it feels like I've been all over the space as I looked at this sermon this morning and preparing, declaring in Jesus' name, spiritual warfare, a little on healing, knowing the will of God. But I want to tell you, it's all part of the same thing. When I end just looking at Jesus' example on this whole issue of what to do, the will of the Father. In Matthew 12, we have the disciples picking some grain out oh, there plucking some heads. I'm not sure how they prepared them for the meal, whether they had a little masher or what, but they're picking some grain so they can eat. And it's on a Sabbath. And the Sabbath police are out, the religious guys, you know them. They look a lot like us, and sometimes they are us, but anyhow. But they're out making sure nobody breaks the rules. And Jesus makes a, a bold declaration that he's the Lord of the Sabbath and it's he who makes and upholds the truth. And he talks about the hypocrisy of those who would judge such things. And then to make his point, he looks out there and he sees somebody with a withered hand and he heals him. Now we can start a whole new message there. But could I cut to the chase this morning and say this? It's always the right time to do good. It's always the right time to expect a miracle. It's always the right time for praying for somebody, even if they aren't a Christian or a and you get an opportunity and, and you just go, okay, can I pray for you? And they go, yeah, and you go, okay, I'm gonna do it right now, is that okay? Well, okay. Could I put a hand on your shoulder? Okay. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just go, Lord Jesus, I know you love this person. I'm just asking that you would be here this day. And I command that pain out, that injury out, that whatever out in the name of Jesus and thy will will be done. Does that sound really weird? We made it weird somehow in the church. I want to tell you that's a really comforting thing to do. You know what's really exciting is when I do it with somebody and nothing happens and I'm just grieved and I go, Lord, where were you? I was there, where were you? You know, and, and, and the person goes, oh, I was really hoping that would work. Oh, I want to be praying for you because you're showing faith. God loves that. We have people that want the real thing. They want to see a powerful God. They want to see a church alive. They want to see people loving on them. And they want to know that the God that created them is still going, I chose you and I know you by name and I love you. We can make quite a difference. Stand with me. I've uh, had quite a week this week, just another week of spiritual warfare. You know what, I think we're into good stuff here. Enemy isn't liking it much. Uh, this is life changing, if we will use it. Not if we just learn it, if we will use it. Heavenly Father, by the, your holy name, by the name of Jesus we pray, that, we're, that our hearts would be so full of your love and your truth that we would just go forward. Lord, the enemy's got nothing for us. We serve the mighty master of all things who created all things, who's written the last chapter. And we say, yes, Lord, let's go. I'm ready. Holy God, just touch our hearts. Increase our faith. Diminish our fears. And give us strength, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.